Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship and pray that as we are gathered, our hearts are open to the Holy Spirit and to the leading of the Holy Spirit, whether we are here or on, online. And uh, today I want to invite you to uh, continue the journey with us as we have been looking at this theme of uh, full to the brim an expansive Lent and the invitation of what that is for us in terms of allowing ourselves to be filled by the grace of God. And so we've been looking at stories of grace, uh, stories and themes of God's grace. And this week, we're looking at the theme of brazen acts of beauty. So thinking of beauty and the importance of beauty for the spiritual journey, for our lives, for our world. And there will be a lot of art pieces uh, throughout the service. I'm so excited about it, but I hope you'll find it as exciting as I do. Uh, and I understand if you don't, but we'll let the Holy Spirit decide what that is for us. And so today we'll begin with an art piece uh, from uh, Reverend Larissa Kwong Abazia. And uh, Abazia was one of the co-moderators of the General Assembly for the Presbyterian Church. Anyway, she, she painted this uh, based on the story of the woman, Mary, who anointed Jesus' feet at, uh, right, right before he goes into Jerusalem in Bethany. So this was part of the story where she pours a lot of nard on his feet and anoints his feet and then uses her hair to uh, dry it. So anyway, in this, in this story, there's this uh, image of beauty that uh, Abasia created for us. And so she says in, this, in the chapter just before this, Lazarus dies and Jesus weeps. But after being laid in the tomb, Lazarus is raised and made well. The act solidifies for the chief priests and Pharisees that Jesus is a dangerous threat. In response, they order for his arrest and plot how they will kill him. So that's kind of the background of that story. And Jesus goes into the wilderness and hides. And then the question is, will he return? And so despite the threats, Jesus goes back and enters into the house of his friends. And they have dinner there. And this is, this is kind of the backdrop of one, when Mary anointed his feet. And so this is what the artist uh, has to say about this. This image began as a painting on raw canvas. With fluid strokes of paint, I allowed the colors to run and bleed into each other. As I drew Mary kneeling, I omitted the other details in the scene, removing Jesus' feet, the other guests, the table full of food. I wanted to focus on Mary's brazen act of pouring out the expensive perfume a commodity valued at a year's worth of wages. The luxurious liquid is exp expansive flowing out toward us as the viewer. So there's that invitation to be included in that anointing. It bleeds into the red, foreshadowing the blood Jesus will soon shed. The vessel she holds is lined with gold, a reference to the ancient Japanese practice of kensuke, of repairing broken pottery with gold lacquer. I don't know if you've seen that where there's a brokenness. The Japanese use gold to mend a broken uh, pot and it, may, it brings that kind of level of beauty to it. So in the brokenness, the art of Kintsuki embellishes the cracks and transforms shattered vessel into a new object of beauty. In this embodied act of worship, Mary is practicing Kintsuki boldly celebrating the beauty of life, even as death approaches. So it's an invitation to uh, allow today the beauty of her act to speak to us today about where we are, what are, what are we longing for, where are our spirits empty and needing to be filled with the power of love. So I invite you to take a deep breath. And open your heart to God in worship. Maybe place your hands over your heart as you join me in the call to worship. May we find courage here. Courage to follow our call. Courage to live out our faith. May we find hope here. Hope for a better world. Hope that refuses to let us go. 
May we find truth here. May we find all that we seek, and in our seeking, may we know God. Amen. Please stand as you are able and sing uh, with me hymn number 267, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
I invite you at this time to share any joys or concerns that you may have. If you'd like to share something, please raise your hand and I am happy to bring a microphone to you. Okay. Um, I would ask for prayers for my, the family of my nephew, Andy Merkel, who died unexpectedly this week. Prayers for the family of Andy Merkel and for you, Kay, and all that will be supporting. brother-in-law has been suffering from mm. um, long-term effects of his Parkinson's disease and um, this week he was admitted to strong mm. and um, he is now at the Livingston County Rehab Center and um, we really don't know how long he will be there so prayers please for he and his wife my sister okay. so prayers for Shirley Layden's brother-in-law and the whole family as they walk this journey with him Any other prayers? Okay, Sandy. I would like us all to pray for Rula's brother Thank out you. in California who Thank is you. still recovering. Thank you. Continued prayers. Recovering, struggling, and, and the same thing, you know, what you were saying, you know, how long can one endure? We had to, on Friday night, we had to put our cat to sleep. Uh, she's, she was almost 18, um, had a good, wonderful life. We brought her with us from Oregon, and so she, um, but it was really hard to, to know when, you know, and, and God was gracious to make it clear that it was time. And I did think, I thought, you know, we're, we're more humane to our animals than to ourselves you know when we are struggling in health and you know we keep it we prolong it so much and it, it is such a hardship on the person so i know that for my brother i was thinking of my brother and um you know i i want him to be around i want him to be there for me but at the same time know how this is so hard so prayers for all who suffer and struggle um, with prolonged illnesses any other prayers? I want to keep Winston Pottle in our prayers too. He's been struggling and declining and has had a lot of issues. And today we were supposed to share something, but I'm holding off. We'll, we'll wait until next week, hopefully, to ask for some support from the congregation. But in the meantime, I ask you to pray for him. And so a gratitude moment today is uh, for... This Saturday, we're having the Easter egg hunt and breakfast, uh, brunch. So we invite you all to come, invite children in your life to come and enjoy that. And I want to give thanks for all the generosity of people bringing. There is so much candy in, now in the office. It's like a pile of candy and eggs. It's like we, we share, we put something simple in the in the newsletter saying, you know, please bring candy. And it's like the response is just so amazing. It's God's grace in action. Uh, talking about full to the brim, that office is full to the brim with candy. And I know David Blake will be happy when this is over. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for stirring people's hearts. For I know, I know it will bring so much joy to the children who will receive it. And we have actually from the community a couple of people that, uh, businesses that said, oh, we want to donate baskets. We didn't even solicit. And it's just the, the generosity is just overwhelming to receive. And, to, and I'm thinking, is this for real? Like I've, at first when I received the messages, they, they used Facebook. I thought it was, a, you know, like somebody scamming us. Like, how is this? That, how did they hear about it? And how did they want, how did they feel like moved to donate? So it's just been amazing. And if you would like to help, uh, if you want to come and help with the event, uh, we'd love to have you help with that too. There's plenty to do and a lot of fun. So I invite us to take a deep breath again 
and prepare our hearts to pray together. Loving God, we come grateful today for all the beauty around us. Beauty that catches our breath. We thank you for the courage you give us. Courage to stand up for the people we love. We praise you for the amazing gifts of your Holy Spirit. Who is brave for us when we are not? Who quieted the voice of critique? We thank you, O oh God, for you believe in us. Amen. Now we take a few moments of silence to bring our prayers and our hearts before God. And we continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So today, thinking about brazen acts of beauty, I uh, came across a few weeks ago this uh, art project for the Bible. It was a surprise to me that somebody would think this way of presenting the Bible. It's uh, from two young artists who, uh, one of them was new to the faith, and he was excited about reading the Bible, but then when he uh, looked at the Bible, it was unusual for him to see a book that was dark, the cover was dark, the pages were thin, the print was fine. Any of you experienced that with Bibles? Yeah, I mean, that's what we normally think of. It's just, I've never even, it never occurred to me that the Bible would look anything but that. So this uh, young man, Brian uh, uh, Chung, said, you know, for someone that didn't grow up Christian, it was unlike any other book experience I'd had. For someone that had studied design in college, I thought to myself, how could this be done differently? So interesting, that question of how he could present it differently. And so we're going to watch a video about uh, the project. And this is from a couple, a few years ago when they started this uh, project called Alabaster. We live in a visual world. Social media like Instagram and Snapchat are part of our daily life routines. Our websites, our technology, our spaces, they are all becoming more aware of design. And because of this, I think the question of what is beautiful is becoming increasingly important. The church used to be the center of beauty. The cathedrals, Renaissance paintings, stained glass windows, they were all beautiful. And they were made not only to help people experience God, but also to describe who God is. With this project, Alabaster, we are hoping to play a role in exhibiting the beauty of God. Our culture is changing. However, our Bible design has relatively remained the same. Similar to old master Renaissance artists who looked at the scriptures and created these beautiful pieces of art from them, we wanted to do the same. And we asked ourselves, what would that look like today? As a result, we decided to take the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, integrate visual imagery within that text and design the Bible beautifully. My name is Brian Chung. I'm an artist and photographer. I am a campus minister at a art and design college, and I'm one of the creators of Alabaster. My name is also Brian Chung. Yes, you have the same name. I'm a designer. I've done campus ministry at the University of Los Angeles for the past six years, and I'm also one of the creators of Alabaster. We believe that great art has always done more than tell a quick literal message. Great art creates dialogue. It makes us think. For some of the images, we wanted to observe what was happening in the text and thoughtfully use design to communicate connection points in the passage we might see or not normally see. We also wanted to make images that could capture the emotional impact of what the passages are talking about. Some are literal and some are abstract. And these images are meant to be wrestled over, interacted with. As you look at the image and read the text side by side, ultimately we hope it creates a deeper interaction with God. This project is called Alabaster based on one of the only times in the Gospels that Jesus calls something beautiful. In Mark 14, we find a woman breaking an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, and pouring it onto Jesus' head, anointing him. The act is extreme. Many, Many people, people at the scene see what she does and scoff at her. They say, what are you doing? Something that expensive could have been used on the poor. But Jesus defends the woman, saying, leave her alone. Why do you bother her? What she has done is a beautiful thing. Inspired by this passage, to create the cover, we took a piece of alabaster stone and broke it into four separate pieces. The different pieces of the alabaster have become the cover for each different gospel.
interesting creation, and incidentally, I, I brought some of those uh, creations uh, to share with you. If you'd like, following the service, they're on the communion table over there. If you'd like to take a look at what they've created, it's beautiful. It, it makes you think. It makes you pay attention and meditate with art to use uh, the stories of Scripture. So beauty is an important part of the story of faith. We don't often think about it, but it is an, an essential part of the faith. And God is the ultimate creator of beauty. If you looked outside, if you look at nature, if you look at all the universe, you see that. And in this week, I think there are some planetary events that will be happening, and I'm excited. I hope, I think they're looking at Wednesday. If you go and look at the sky, you'll see really bright uh, stars and planets in, in, on display for us. So, so it is God's majesty is displayed and beauty is displayed in so many different ways. And so when we create and behold art, we participate. We are participating in God's very essence and life in and around us. And so we sometimes think it's, it's a waste. You know, why do you need all of this? And it's interesting that in our Bible story, uh, Mary is accused of wasting because the act was so uh, wasteful. But was it? And think of how the story reminds us of how God's grace, kind of last week we talked about uh, being a prodigal grace, that God was effusive and giving so much. And here it is, another act reminding us of God's grace. So beauty helps us to fill our souls when they feel empty. Uh, when when the life is hard, when we experience a deep loss of someone we love, and it's not anything we expected, and especially when the person is in the prime of their lives, how do you uh, deal with that? Where do you find sustenance for your soul? And when we see people being cruel to each other, in the same way, beauty restores us to that longing of life. And in our story, uh, there was all this upheaval before we get to the part we're reading from John 12 against Jesus. Jesus had to flee. He couldn't be in public because they ordered uh, him to be killed after he raised Lazarus from the dead. To them, that was the ultimate offense because now he had a real big following. People were like, wow, look what he can do. So they really wanted to follow Jesus. And as a result, the resistance grew stronger. So this woman, Mary, needed to encourage Jesus, needed to support him because he was re-entering the fray. He was re-entering the resistance and was headed to Jerusalem. But he stopped at the house of his friends. So they lavished him with all kinds of love and acts of beauty to show him that he was so important to them as he was moving toward that act. So let's listen to this story from John 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave, him a, di they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, and I love how, you know, in parentheses, this is, this is the author telling us, you know, this is a bad guy. The one who was about to betray him. You've seen that in movies. You know, you get to see the crime first, and then everybody else in the show doesn't know what's going on. But we know. We have the advantage. We know this guy is a bad guy. So he says, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Again, lest we miss it, Judas is a really bad guy. So the author tells us, he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what, he, what was put into it. So Jesus had a really dishonest treasurer. Uh, and, and this is the guy. He's looking at this cost and thinking, you know, why would we, why would we waste it? I could have used some of the money. I could have skimmed $10,000 or so. So Jesus said, leave her alone. She, she bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. 
And so Jesus defended her action. And uh, the whole, I'm sure the disciples, the other people who were having the dinner, were experiencing this act of lavish love. Because if you've ever had, I mean, can you imagine a pound of perfume broken in one room, in one house? How would it smell? Pretty potent. Uh, and so, incidentally, today we, uh, I have some nard, but I mix it with another oil just to make sure it's not too powerful for you, because I know, and I wonder if it's, I ask permission in the first service and they let me do it. There will be a time of anointing if you would like that after. Are we okay to, it's very faint. You, you won't overpower the space. And you'll actually have to go like this to, to really spell it. So, are we okay to do that after? Okay, and you can remain seated, you don't have to. And for those of you who don't wanna walk up, I'm happy to bring that to you as well. So thinking of how expensive and, and rare this perfume was, this was used for burial, and people would have used a lot less, not a whole pound. But thinking of the amount of money, it's a, it, it was about worth $55,000. So you're thinking it was brought from northern India, very rare, very expensive, and she takes the whole thing and pours it on his feet. You think, you know, Judas, of course, is speaking for the rest of us. When someone does something that outrageous, what would we say if we were present? Why all that waste? Why all that waste? Jesus was the one saying, you know, uh, Judas was the one speaking about why, why waste, but but Jesus saw this as an act of deep love that he needed. And, and it was a reminder. And I can't help but think that because of those days, people didn't uh, shower a lot and, and bathe a lot. Six days later, when he's getting crucified, that smell, when he was feeling that pain, the smell was still with him. Imagine that, how powerful that is. I mean, because we know, I mean, if you've uh, gone to the beach and you come back and your towel smells like the beach, how does it feel? It takes you right back to that experience. That sense of smell is so powerful for us. No wonder we use, uh, it, throughout history, people have used incense and all kinds of smells in worship because it brings people back to that sense. And so this experience of amazing love of brazen uh, beauty was given to Jesus to carry him to the cross to help him remember. So he's on the cross. He's smelling this. What is he thinking about? He's thinking of the love that he shared. He's, he's feeling that love. He's right there in that moment of knowing that he is so loved, even on the cross, even in the worst of what humanity can give. And so today the invitation is for us to consider what that means for us, how these acts of beauty carry us through so many challenges in life. Think of the flowers at a funeral or cards or any act of beauty that you share with, with others who are struggling. When we're engulfed in that time of grief, we need to be reminded you are loved. You are struggling today, but you're never far away from God's love. In his book, Beauty, uh, John O'Donohue shares this, the importance of our soul's yearnings for beauty. Uh, he said there's a surfeit of ugliness, coarseness, and tawdriness in the media, in architecture, in our environment. There's a lot of ugliness around us, he says. In turning away from beauty, we turn away from all that is wholesome and true. And so thinking of the importance of beauty for our souls, for our world today, uh, and he says far too, uh, too much emphasis is put upon good looks, image, and fashion. Far too little attention is given to the dignity, grandeur, and nobility of the human spirit. So not just, you know, just because beauty sometimes gets that, that image that it's about things uh, in fashion or you know something looks really pretty but it's about that deeper reality so this invitation this week for us is about entering into that story letting it speak to us letting it transform our pain letting it 
help us go out into the world and do the same for others. It might be a simple act of, of care like the women who knit the shawls. The beauty of, this, of the design and the color when people are feeling wrapped by that brings that sense of, of love. Actually, last Saturday, we were having a, a planning retreat here and someone was freezing because somehow the heat wasn't working in the chapel. And uh, somebody went, oh, I think it was uh, Bonnie's daughter. Uh, so she went, because oh, she's, I, I put her as Bonnie's daughter. She's in her, her own person. But she knows about where the prayer shawls, uh, Becky, you know, knits with them in the summer. So she ran and grabbed that prayer shawl and wrapped this person with it and gave it as a gift. And it was just a, a, a small act of kindness and love, but it reminded that person that they're cared for. I know probably that wasn't your intention for prayer shawls, to keep people warm in church, but, but it was in that moment a very meaningful, simple act of love. So I want to invite us to consider what that is for us. And I, one more, one more artist, sorry, today is like... I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry, Don. I'm trying to, trying to be brief, but I can't help myself. This is this this really spoke to my spirit, and I hope it will do the same thing for you. And uh, this is an, another Christian artist. His name is Makoto Fujimura, and he combines his Christian faith with with his uh, Japanese culture, and the art uh, and how to make it bring messages of hope, especially after destruction. And he uses this image of ground zero and different experiences for people around the world of ground zero and how you bring wholeness to those situations. And so he says, do we need beauty in our lives? If we desire to be fully human, the answer is yes, absolutely. But even this question is ultimately utilitarian. We must shift from asking, what do we need? To what do we long for? Consider that for you. What do you long for? It's not just always about, you know, okay, we have food on the table, everything is clean, everything is organized, but what about that extra touch of beauty, of care? And so he says that there is hunger in the soul. Art is not ultimately useful. It serves no practical function. And this is why it is in indispensable, especially in the modern age. And so we're going to watch a little video, too, about his presentation of the art. Okay, okay so, so this, this is Tokuo Ken, Ken the uh, home of <laughs> Nihonga. You, you see all the brushes, brushes and pigments, pigments lined up. up. If you ever want to know what Japanese aesthetic is about, this, this is, is the place, place to experience, experience it. it. So let's go in. We are standing on the 26 Martyrs Hill. This is the bay that opens into the world. I think my journey of science and beauty became tracing that. September 11, 2001, I had this crazy thought to journey into true ground zeros of the world. Why is God silent? Why did God allow this horrific meltdown to happen? All those questions have no answers. And I, I think that's what our work is about. Hey. Mako has a rhythm to his speech that's very much like a, like a musician. We speak similar languages. We can set our crafts 
in the same direction. That's one of the greatest things about Japanese culture is that, you know, they import things and then they refine and make it even better. <laughs> you know. そういうアプローチをからあのよくずっと聞いてきたんですが私たちも私自身も、えー、新しいそのアプローチに、えー、共感して。Whatever you're carrying with you, and if you're an artist, you're carrying a lot. You're carrying a lot of message about society, the future, what you hope will happen、uh, in the future, and about beauty. All of that can be opened up here. And so today, the invitation is for us to take these different messages about beauty and to ask what is your soul longing for? As you ponder this theme and be filled to the brim with praise and acts of beauty, how does this speak to you where you are? Whether you're having a great week or you've had a tough week, or whether you're feeling very successful and life ahead is just wonderful, or feeling like life is meaningless. Or you're experiencing the pain of the world right now all on your shoulders. The same invitation is for each of us to open our hearts to what that means and how it would give us the courage. Beauty grounds us in God's love. And so I want to invite us to ponder the words of a poem by Reverend Sarah R. Speed.、Uh, it's Lessons from a Winter Rose. And after that, right immediately after that, the invitation is to come forward as you are able and、uh, receive the anointing. And the anointing、uh, could be on, the, on your hand, or you could put it also on your wrist if you want, to, you want it to linger a little longer, whatever your option. And you may remain seated, and I can bring、uh, the oil to you, or、uh, you can also decline receiving that. So, whatever the Spirit. Does for you. But the invitation is the same, is to really experience. I mean, why do we do anointings in the church? Why do we do any of these things? It's for us to experience the beauty, the grandeur, the love of God in our hearts, not just to think about them, but to really know them in our hearts. I'm dumbfounded by the sheer persistence of a winter rose that blooms on the coldest of days. When the rest of the world has turned dim and gray, when the rest of the world is sleeping, the audacity to stand so tall, to decorate the world with color, to be the only one brave enough to bloom, I wonder what that, what's that like? Maybe it's similar to pouring perfume on the feet of Jesus, shocking and beautiful at the same time. On winter morning walks, I pass a bed of roses. I dare not pick one. Instead, I say thank you. Thank you for the beauty. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you for the bloom. And I walk home and pray, God, if you can, make me that brave. Amen.
God, we give you thanks for these gifts, for the reminder that we belong to you and that beauty is all around us, all inside us. Help us as we see acts of beauty to be reminded of your love for us. Help us also today as we go from this place to share that beauty with others, especially those who are hurting. We pray this in the way of Jesus Christ the anointed one. Amen. I invite you at this time to uh, stand as you are able and sing with me hymn number 319, Spirit.
and for the blessing as you go today, as you leave this place, may you be awestruck by the beauty of this world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy and in all of your living and breathing and being. May you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit and may it change your life in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Go in peace, full to the brim. Amen. Please turn to your neighbors and share the peace of Christ.